Check, check, check. All right. We're going to try to struggle with this microphone again tonight. Everyone can hear me all right? And the back's okay? Okay. Very good. Well, welcome to session 27 of Miracles and Parables. We're going to be discussing our second set of discussion about parables of repentance. And we'll talk about two specific parables from Luke and from Matthew. Um, let's begin with a prayer. Our most righteous heavenly Father, we are in awe of your power, of your mercy, but your might. As we discuss these parables tonight, talking about both your fury and your forgiveness, please help us to recognize that we too are in a condition of deciding our fate in terms of our uselessness or our usefulness to you. Please help, please help us to learn from these stories of your son that he gave to us in teaching us how to become more like him. These things we ask and pray through your son's name. Amen. Okay. I'm not sure how that happened, but... I'm <laughs> Almost like a peal of thunder in the background, right? Electronic thunder. Okay, we'll be talking about uh, these parables. I'm not going to go through what a parable is for you. I think we've, we might have that by now. But I do want to talk about uh, a parable, in uh, a modern-day parable, lending from something I'm very familiar with, and I, I think you'll be familiar with what I'm going to talk about mostly in uh, thinking about a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who's an extremely talented uh, surgeon and is a very high demand surgeon, high volume surgeon. Lots of people want to see him. If you want an appointment, you're going to wait for a long time. That kind of guy. Um, if you think about someone like that, it means they're probably doing all the right things. And one of the right things for a surgeon is to think about the risks involved. And you're thinking about doing surgery on somebody and you want to say, I want to minimize the risks or mitigate the risks. Risks. What kinds of things might that person have in mind? The patient's safety. Patient safety. Let's hone in on the patient himself. Risk factors with the patient. Young. Young. <laughs> That's a good one. That's not on my list, but that might be, now that I'm on the other end of that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all those things. Losing weight, that's a big factor for almost any kind of surgery. Even if you think about foot surgery or something, you go, well, my feet aren't fat. But if you're obese, it lends towards complications. So we're trying to reduce complications. That's one of them. I'll mention the other end of that. If you're someone who is very, very thin, you're a person that tries to be super skinny and you're on the skinny side and your, your protein levels are low, that means you're at risk of having infections, wound healing problems, all kinds of things. Um, alcohol and tobacco were mentioned by Paula. Alcohol is a big factor um, in terms of complications, both before surgery, during surgery, after surgery. And then she mentioned smoking, a huge one. And this is one of the ones in which we as orthopedic doctors were very much concerned about. And this particular friend of mine was really picky on all these things and some other things too. But to the, the point that if you wanted him to do your surgery and you had some of these things in your description of how you live, guess what? Kyle's shaking his head. He knows these things. This friend of mine would say, sorry, here's the weight you need to be. If you're not going to be there, you need to go see somebody else. In fact, on the smoking issue, that was such a huge thing for him because we know that infection rates are twice as high in smokers. And for orthopedics, talking about bones healing together, it's almost impossible for smokers in some bones. So it was a big enough thing for him that he would actually test your serum nicotine level on the morning of surgery. So if you said, oh, I quit, I quit six months ago, he would trust that 
to schedule the surgery, but he would verify that on the day of surgery. If he had a positive nicotine level, guess what happened? Canceled. All that stuff he went through, out the, down the drain. But for a reason. Because, he said, it's not worth the risk. If you can't make these changes, if you can't make these changes in your lifestyle, you're not going to get the surgery. So, this friend of mine, I think, might have been trained uh, by whoever Luke, the physician, got his training. Very. Absolutely. That's why he does it. He, yeah. I think he cares about people, but he's really just cared about not messing up. Maybe, more than anything else. But I think perhaps this friend of mine might have, might have trained with Luke, the physician. <laughs> I say that a little tongue-in-cheek. If I'm thinking about Luke, the physician, who wrote this parable that we're going to talk about, how might that be important? Okay, I've got everybody stumped, good. Okay, we'll talk about Luke. We know that Luke is, um, of the writers of the Gospels, is, is kind of out there on his own in many ways. There's a lot of things he really emphasizes. And one of the things he really emphasizes is repentance. Repentance. Now we'll talk about repentance. Luke 3 and verse 3. At the very beginning, if you want to turn to chapter 3 and look in verse 3, he describes John's ministry, John the Baptist. He says there in verse 3 that he proclaimed a baptism of repentance. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it was written, prophetically, he was talked about. This was told many, many years ago in the time of Isaiah. In the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Pretty stinging words and pretty scary words. Enough that the crowd said, what should we then do? So what's the response? Keep smoking, keep drinking, don't lose any weight. You'll be fine. No. No. Now, he doesn't talk about smoking. He doesn't talk about losing. But he does talk about change. And the bottom line is, if you can't decide to make those changes, then you're not going to be a recipient of the blessings that we're talking about. And you're not going to avoid the fury to come. So this little symbol... Those of you under 30 know what that is, I think. What's the metaverse? Nobody really knows. <laughs> what, is, what is that? Why do they call the metaverse metaverse? Okay. What? Not real. Not real. <laughs> it means beyond or... 
a change. It means a lot of things in Greek, but in this particular word, repentance, it comes from this word, metanoia. Now, the noia part sounds like paranoia and a bunch of other psychological words that have to do with your thoughts. The meta part means sort of a change or a transformation into something different. So it's really a change of mind or a transformation of your thought. Now, go back to our analogy with the smoker that says, okay, I want you to do my surgery, doctor. Okay, but I see you're smoking. Well, I really, I'm, I'm ready to quit. I've changed my mind. Does he go, okay, we're going to sign you up. If not, why not? Evidence. Yep, Sharon says, I want to know that it's the change has really taken place. Because you can say all the words you want to do, but what's the transformation in your life style? What's happened? What's changed? If you think about these recipients of Jesus' teaching and John the Baptist's teaching, what should we then do? John the Baptist's audience, right then and there, became baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, is what John preached. Um, so we're going to talk about this idea of repentance and how it deals with um, some of these parables. And it goes back to that reading in, at the beginning of Luke in chapter 3 when he says this about the fruits, meat for repentance. What does that mean in the meat for repentance? It's a bit of an old word or old translation. Jay said their heart was set against this. He called them a brood of vipers. Pretty hard words. How would you feel if someone said, <laughs> you're a brood of vipers? Pretty hard words. But it underscores the fact that Jesus is making a comment. And John here, you're not, you're, you're not ready to make a change in your mind or your heart or your life, your lifestyle. Everyone that, that was baptized here by John was expected to do three things. When he asks, what should we do? He says, the first thing is, help the poor. Verse 11. He says, if you've got two tunics, give one to someone who has none. And look for people around you that are in need to fulfill their needs. That's an important principle. Number two, what does he say to the tax collectors specifically? Don't take more than what you're supposed to. We know that the tax collectors at that time were, reputation, reputation was, they're going to get you for not just what you're worth, but as much as they can tweak out of you. So he told them, collect no more than what people actually owed the government, the Roman government at that time. What about soldiers? Don't. I'm sorry. Yep, satisfied with wages. Be satisfied with the wage that you make. And before that, he says, don't extort from people. They had the ability, they had the sword, and they had the ability to, to run rough shut over the population. So don't do that. He expected that from everyone he uh, told them about changing their lifestyles. It wasn't just a matter of changing their, their minds, but changing their lifestyles, making a change in the things that they're doing. Luke is also the only one that records the story of Zacchaeus. Who was Zacchaeus in this ongoing series of repentance tales? A wee little man. He was a, and a wee little man was he. That's right, Sharon. So Zacchaeus, uh, we know that's a Jewish name. He was a Jewish Israelite. We know that he was in Luke, the story of Luke 19, in those 10 verses, that he was a wealthy tax collector. And so we can kind of guess based upon what he says later and by reputation, that means he was also 
extorting. He was a corrupt tax collector. So a person that was in need of making some changes, right? We know the story uh, from the city of Jericho. And Jesus, this is toward the latter part of his ministry. He's about to enter Jerusalem. Jericho is right to the east. He goes through Jericho. And this man who lives in Jericho has heard of his reputation, is excited to see him such that he wants to be able to see, so he climbs the sycamore tree to, to, to actually see Jesus and hear him speaking. And at that moment, when he meets him, remember Jesus looks up in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today, and I want you to dine with me. And, G, and G, Zacchaeus accepts the truth of the gospel, and he makes changes. He repents. He doesn't just say, I'm going to do better. He makes changes. And what does he say he's going to do? You remember? Give back fourfold. Yep. Donna says, give back fourfold. He says, I'm going to sell all my possessions, first of all. Sounds just like John the Baptist's recommendations and, and his commands. Look out for the poor. So he says, I'm going to sell everything I've got, or half of my, what I've got, and give to the poor. And then number two, as Donna mentioned, I'm going to repay those that I've cheated. So he's saying, yeah, I've, I've done that. Hey, I'm a tax collector. That's what we do. But I'm going to give it back. And this is in accordance to the Levitical law, Exodus 22, where if you stole sheep, you give back four times the sheep. If you steal an ox, you give back five times the oxen. So he's repaying back. And this is the setting we see for the barren uh, fig tree parable from Luke 13. Turn to Luke 13 now. So Luke here continues his focus of this theme of repentance and all the teachings we're talking about. We know this is sort of in the middle of that section from Luke 9 to Luke 19. It's a section that is just Jesus travels between the beginning of his ministry after the, the 72, after the um, 12 are sent out, then the 70 are sent out. From that moment on, he's teaching in, both in parables and in straight direct teaching until his entry into Jerusalem in chapter 19. There aren't a lot of markers in Luke to tell you exactly when they're speaking of. We know that at the beginning there in chapter 3, talking about John's ministry, there were some real specifics about exactly when John began his ministry. Not a lot of markers to know exactly where we know, but we know that looking at the stories, we know that he's, he's getting close to the end of his, his travels. And his teachings become perhaps a little more harsh, pointed, vitriolic. And we know just before this account, um, this is preceded by several different warnings. If you look in chapter 12 and chapter 11 even, um, the warnings leading up to this parable make us think certain things about this parable. So we'll talk about the warnings and how, this, how it's being set up, if you will, by Luke telling this, this story. In Luke 11, we know Jesus talks about the six woes on the Pharisees, very harsh, judgmental comments made about the leaders of the, of, the, of the Jewish world at that time. In chapter 12, he gives, again, warnings through chapter 12, talks about the unforgivable sin and gives warnings about that. And then the entire part of the last uh, part of chapter 12 is calls for watchfulness. Be on the lookout. Be expectant of judgment to come. So that's kind of the setting for this, this parable about the, the fig tree. Raise your hand if you've ever actually seen and been up and close with a fig tree. Okay. A few folks here. I, I guarantee if I was in northern Indiana, I wouldn't see many hands. If I was in Wisconsin, I'd see no hands, right? Because fig trees tend to be more of a temperate region fruit. And that's much the case for the Middle East. We see them occasionally, but they saw them all the time. Now, once again, the idea of a parable is taking something very, very familiar with someone, laying it alongside something they're not familiar with, making the analogy to make the point and let them hopefully discover the concept themselves. Those of you that are teachers know what's the best way to teach. 
<laughs> that's Bubba's idea. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And that's a very effective way. But what about that moment when you haven't actually gone into full explanation of all the details, but you've laid it all out and you wait for the student to put the pieces together? Those of you that have taught, have you ever done that and you see the look on your students' faces when they go, aha, the aha moment. You always hear about that. That's what that is. So here's something that's very well known to these people. Remember, we, were gonna, we want to put ourselves at the feet of Jesus on that dusty road listening to him and listening to these parables. So we got to think like a Middle East Jew who's known all about figs forever. Figs are part of them. Why the fig tree? Why was it used? From the very beginning of their history, think about Adam and Eve in the garden. They sinned. They recognized they were naked. And what happened? Fig leaves. Sewed them together. Some scholars have said it was, the fruit was probably a fig because that was such a common thing for them. So even from the very beginning, what about when the spies were sent into Canaan? Number 13, they brought back grapes, pomegranates, and figs. It was part of the, the landscape from the very beginning, before they even became a nation. And you think about figs, how important it was throughout their whole economy. It was like talking about Kentucky basketball in Bowling Green. I'm sorry, Louisville fans, I didn't mean to bring that up. But it was something extremely familiar to them and economically extremely important. Grapes were number one, figs were number two in their whole economy. Olives were a distant third. We think about olive oils, they were a distant third to what the importance of grapes and figs were. So when they had a bad fig season, everybody suffered. So figs were really a big deal. They also had big leaves. How would that figure into some of this parable here? This is a variety of fig that has a bigger leaf than most, but they all have big leaves. And so you think about sewing them into clothing, that'd be something you think about. But as well as being a garment material, you think about the symbolism involved. Think about that Jew sitting at the feet of Jesus. What is he thinking about with figs? How would it tie into the idea of God's favor and God's judgment? Any ideas? Okay. If we don't bear fruit, we'll be dug up. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll get to that. Um, what about the leaf idea, though, this big leaf? We talked about this is found mostly in less temperate zones where it's a little warmer and hotter. And Okay, so if I'm going to, Jay said if there's not a lot of foliage, there's generally not a lot of fruit. If there is a lot of foliage, Opposite, there's okay. Generally not a lot of fruit. Okay, so if a plant's putting out a lot of leaves, it doesn't have as much energy to put out a lot of fruit, I think, okay. The shade that it provides. Shade that it provides, yeah. And I, I was kind of, uh, I, I didn't know this until I was studying about this topic. This is actually a fig on the west coast. And uh, fig trees in the right conditions really get big. And this particular tree, if you look at the, the this is the close-up view, look at it from across the street, that's how big it is. Now, this is not an expanded view. This is not artificially expanded. This is the actual picture that's shown. Uh, in fact, that little red circle there is outlining a car under the branches. That's a huge, umbrella of shade. And so for an Israelite living in this kind of condition in these dusty, hot, arid, dry areas, a fig tree was like, whoa. It's like having your air condition sweet, okay? They had plenty of shade and a symbol of God's favor. So favor versus fury. During King Solomon's reign in chapter 4 of 1 Kings, the fig tree is described as each sat 
under the shade of his own vine and fig tree. That was the description for the people of Israel on how great it was during King Solomon. So this Israelite listening to this parable would be thinking along these lines too. Fig tree, that's, you've got it made in the shade, okay? Isaiah 34, warning the nations, Isaiah says, he will come near you nations and listen, pay attention you peoples, let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all that comes out of it. The Lord is angry with all nations, his wrath is on all their armies, he will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Uh, the slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will stink. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved. And the heavens rolled up like a scroll. And the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. The ultimate demise of this nation is it shrivels like a fig. So that's their their mindset in thinking about the symbolic importance of the fig tree here. Jeremiah's um, prophecy against Israel in chapter 5, verse 7, talking about these nations that would come in and destroy Israel. They will devour your harvest and food, devour your sons and daughters. They will devour your flocks and herds, devour your vines and your fig trees. With the sword, they'll destroy the fortified cities in which you trust. And then Joel also has a, a prophetic statement about about Israel as well, when he says, a nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. So lots of references to that. They would, they would link the importance of this fig representing God's favor and the destruction of it being God's fury. But lots of other places, too. The fig was such an important part. 2 Kings 20, when Hezekiah had a terminal illness, Isaiah prepared a poultice of figs to heal him. Uh, Amos 7, in, chapter, in verse 14, we know that Amos wasn't a professional prophet. He was called from being a, you guessed it, a grower of figs. Okay? So this is an important part of their whole society and their thinking. We've already discussed and, and studied the barren fig tree that Jesus cursed to symbolize again judgment on the, the righteous or the religious leaders of Israel. So it has all of these overtones about this. The context is this, Luke 13. Turn, turn to chapter 13 now and look at verse 1. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the others because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So this is the tee up for this parable, talking about the importance of repentance and the warning of not making these lifestyle changes in the decisions and how then they would live. What about this idea of God blessing the good? Jesus touches on it here. The traditional view that they might have held was God blesses the good and punishes the evil. His disciples asking him, Jesus, is this man the one who sinned or his parents? But he reminds them that the story of the Galileans, Pilate murdered these Galileans while they're actually in the act of worship in the temple. And they knew the story. It had made major headlines. Think about that. Think about if we heard about uh, the church in Alberton, you know, being attacked during the services and, and the building set on fire and all members killed. We'd be thinking, what's the justice there? That's the way they were thinking about that story or the tower in Siloam, a natural disaster. The fires in, in Maui, a natural disaster, killing hundreds, hundreds of people, here 18. And he says, is that God's judgment or not? Were they guilty of something to deserve that? Of course the answer is no, they were not terrible sinners. But then he gives this parable to talk about those that will be in harm of, of God's judgment. Luke 13, verse 6, here's the parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. 
So he said to the farmer who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Why should it take up space in my garden? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I'll cut it down. Giving him an alternative for this. Here's this fig tree that's not been bearing any fruit. Think about the significance of some things here. The fig tree was planted. It's been three years. Now, we, as we talked about, we don't want to pull, try to pull too many things out of a parable and say that every detail has a specific meaning, but I think we can make some analogies here. Leviticus 19, uh, verses 23 through 25, say some specifics about fig trees as it does about many things. When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. What? For three years, you are to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruits will be sanctified, holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord, your God. This fits right in with the Levitical code. If you think about this tree that's been growing for three years, we don't eat of it. We know that it takes about that long to begin growing a fruit on a fig tree. And you might get some early fruit in that next year. But all the fruit that comes in, when it comes in, you're not to eat of it. It's to be a first fruit offering to God, right? So here we find this story with the barren fig tree. The fig tree's been planted, and now no fruit in three years. Can you think of any analogies here on this three years? Lord's patient. Lord's patient. But what specifically about the three years? Floyd it talks about Elijah. That, that's a, another, I guess, numerological thing. about. We could think of a lot of threes, right? Jesus died and was raised on the third day. We can think of a lot of threes. But what specifically about this story we think about with three years? What about how long had the people been hearing this message of repentance? About three years. This is right toward the end of Jesus' ministry. He's been ministering, preaching this for about three years, John the Baptist for a short time before him, talking about repentance. So here's waiting for fruits of repentance, and there are none. Um, oops. So this tree has been growing according to the Levitical law in, in chapter 19. We think this tree has been growing for probably six years at this point. So it's past the year of first fruits, into the fifth year in which they should have been eating of the fruit, and now in the sixth year there's still no fruit. And so the concern here is it's going to be cut down. Let's look at some other, other points of potential symbolism. Think about this uh, parable. Give me some, some points about what's what. We could just say it's about repentance and leave it at that. Okay, Mark said, I'm sure most of you could hear, but the fact that God is patient, and we know that in 1 Timothy 2, right? Uh, he's a long-suffering. He wants no one to, to perish, but all should come to the glory of God. Think about that is an idea of, of holding back on fury, if you will, and giving time for people to repent. Um, okay, so we mentioned the three years Jesus' ministry is being potentially associated with that. What about the what about the fig tree itself? What is that representing? Us. 
the people of Israel in this specific time, I think, I think that's exactly right. So many of the other things we've talked about here, Jesus is, has been referring, especially later in the ministry, as, as pointing a finger at the religious leaders. But it implies, as Dan said, applies to us as well, correct? Um, so Israel was the heart of this. And being barren means what in view of both the religious leaders and us? Haven't made the change? Not bearing the fruit that God wants you to bear? And that really means to both the farmer and to God, it means you're useless. It's, why bother? What's the point in this servant who is barren of fruit? We are born in him for the fruits of righteousness. What happens when we don't have any fruits of righteousness? We're useless. Useless to God. But the surprising turn that Mark had mentioned, the surprising turn in this story is, there's a little twist when he says, but wait. Our God is a God of second chances. He is a God of second chances. We are all recipients of the second chance. And the third chance. And the fourth chance. We are in, in the, sitting in the seat of God's grace on a day-by-day -day basis. Every day we're recipients of his grace and mercy. He long suffering, not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance and the glory of God. So mercy is given and time is given for forgiveness. So let's talk about this story as it goes on. It's really um, kind of open-ended, right? It sort of ends right there and you go, well, give me the end. <laughs> It's like watching a whole movie and you get to the end and you go, well, how's it turn out? It's open-ended. We don't know exactly what happens. We know that he's saying that Israel still has time to repent and the fig tree still has time to bear fruit. But we don't know what happened to the fig tree. Do we know what happened to Israel? We do know what happened to Israel. AD 70, the nation was destroyed completely taken down, dismantled, and never to be again to that, that type of a spiritual nation and leader that it was. Um, but if you can draw the analogy to the church, well, things are pretty good. If you can draw the analogy to the church. The fig tree is the church. And it's actually doing pretty good. Dan says if the fig tree is the church, then the church is doing well. And I'm not going to disagree with that at all. Uh, in Matthew 3, going back to um, this um, passage we were referred to earlier, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Remember Paul said, that's of nothing to me. That's no value. I tell you that these stones, from these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. In the same way, James 2 and 17, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, change of your lifestyle, and product producing good deeds, your faith is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds, my good fruits. So that's a question I want each of us to ask ourselves right now. Is your life fruitful right now? Right now. Wednesday night, right now, 2023. Or is it useless to God? We don't be thinking about an ax. We want to think about producing fruit and, and making God pleased with us. Yes.
the significance when that miracle happened, about it being immediate. Okay? Um, tell me what you're thinking about, Jay. There were no questions about what happened there. Yeah. Good. We're going to talk about this parable of the two sons. There's not a lot of, of things to talk about here, but there's some definite things to pull out of it. Turn to Matthew 21 and verses 28 through 32. And this, this comes directly after the uh, story that Jay is referencing with the, the fig tree being withered in verse 18. Here in verse 28, uh, recall setting up for this was when the authority of Jesus was questioned and the, the Pharisees said, Why, how are you doing this? By whose authority? And Jesus says, tell me, what about John the Baptist? Does his authority come from man or from God? And they say, oh, we don't know how to answer that. So they say, we're not going to tell you. And his, his response is, then neither will I tell you from where my authority comes. And immediately after that, he jumps into this parable. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and did the same thing, said the same thing. He answered and said, I will, sir. But he did not go. Here's the setting. One that is outwardly obedient, he says it, but doesn't do it. One that is outwardly refusing, but then he does it. Then the father went to the other son. I'm sorry. Verse 31, which of the two did what his father wanted? They answered, the first. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Remember, he's talking to these Pharisees. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Bottom line, how would you sum this up in one statement? Repent or else. <laughs> repent or else. And repentance is not about what I say, but what I do. Not what I say, but what I do. So let's get the mirror out tonight when we get home and think about our spiritual selves and be thinking about, am I just saying or am I doing and my doing, is it just me showing up every time the door is open, or is it doing the works that have been laid before me to do? Are we doing good to others around us? Are we taking care of the poor? Are we looking out to make sure that we're not treating someone unfairly? Are we trying to go positively towards doing these good deeds? Thank you for your attention. Appreciate you.